it's no fun when our kids are sick, but we may just have found the silver lining. Apple and raspberry and orange flavoured electrolyte slushies made by Rehydrate. Rehydrate slushies are a tasty way to get essential electrolytes into our little ones when they're dehydrated from sickness or even just the Aussie heat. They're delicious and they'll help your little ones feel better in no time. Grab Rehydrate from Coles today. It's the Happy Families Podcast. It's the podcast for the time poor parent who just wants answers now. Parents and teachers should let go of the idea that they need to know everything and they need to be right. Way better to be wrong and to not know things and share with your child the experience of getting to know something you don't know. And now here's the stars of our show, my mum and dad. Hello once again, this is Dr. Justin Coulson, the author of six books about raising happy families. I've got six daughters, I've got one wife who I call Kylie, but you probably call Mrs. Happy Families. Last week, we began a series of conversations with Susan Engel about the psychology of education and curiosity in children. One of the mistakes that that people make is the idea that if your child isn't doing something that an adult structured for them, they're not progressing. They're not enriching their minds. It's so great to have Susan back on the podcast this week. Susan's the author of a bunch of books, including a book that I think is compulsory reading for anyone who works in education. If you work with children and young people, The Hungry Mind, The Origins of Curiosity in Childhood, uh, is I think it's a must read. And that's what we've been talking about. Susan's also just released The Intellectual Lives of Children. And like Kylie said, she spends her time lecturing and researching in psychology and education. Thanks again for joining us on the podcast, Susan. When Justin was sharing your book with me, he shared a quote that really impacted me. And I want to read it slowly. You, You first of all give us a definition of curiosity by saying that it's the urge to know more. Mm. But this is what really grabbed me. You said it's an urge that is typically sparked when expectations are violated. That's so good. So let's talk about curiosity. I mean, how do we help our children become more curious? You know, one of the things I talk about in the book is um, this idea that at birth, children begin seeking patterns and familiar, and they know the difference between what's familiar and unfamiliar. So right away, they show signs of knowing the difference between, say, their mother's voice or their father's voice. But often at birth, it's their biological mother's voice that they're familiar with because we think they heard it in utero. So And very quickly, they know the difference between the people that they they see a lot and the people they don't. And then quickly, that extends to other things they're familiar with and their ability to respond differently, or they do respond differently when they're shown something different. And that's what I call, in in both that book and the new book, a novelty detector. Uh, It's one of the most powerful tools that babies are born with. Um, And the second piece of that is that they have a great urge to become comfortable with or familiar with whatever isn't familiar to them. So they want to incorporate what's new into what they know. So that And, and when you think about it, you, none of us could survive if everything was constantly surprising to us. We depend on the fact that many things become familiar and routine, whether it's the people you see every day or the routines of breakfast or, or putting your shoes on. Um, or what's around the corner from your house. This is not unique to humans. Rats have this characteristic too. They seek to sort of tame the unknown. Um, what is so interesting, so part of it is an urge to, to make the unfamiliar familiar. And that ha- that's there at birth. One of the things that makes humans so cool is they have this particular kind of curiosity, which is called epistemic curiosity, the, the eagerness to find out more about why things are the way they are, how things happened. Uh, you clearly had a lot of that because faced with a sense that you weren't doing well as a dad or that your kids weren't doing what you wanted them to, you could have done a million different things. You could have stuck with it and been angry and just kept trying the same old approach. But you didn't. You not only changed your approach, you wanted to understand more about what under, you know, what was going on, the whys and the hows and the, the what's of it all. And that's a fundamental human characteristic uh, and a very powerful one. It, it, I could go on and on about all that it explains in, in human, in the best of human behavior. What's interesting about little kids is they very quickly become very familiar with um, 
with the everyday. So the, you know, the bottle of juice instead of milk is no longer a surprise to them. And uh, the dog walking in the door isn't a surprise. And the, the grandmother or babysitter or neighbor who comes in, they, they get familiar with. And they start to be interested in a, a slightly, what, what will I say, a subtler level of surprise. They begin looking for surprise in more fine-grained ways. So suddenly it's which toy is different from the others or which animal that they haven't seen before. They almost are looking for surprises in the things that interest them. So go back to the dinosaur expert the five-year-old dinosaur expert, uh, very quickly they know everything there is to know about the meat. They know about everything about T-Rex and whatever else the other dinosaurs are. And they begin, the real little young five-year-old experts begin to be surprised about subtler things, which things the T-Rex can and can't fight, uh, what, whether the T-Rex can or can't stand the cold. Uh, I, I mean, I'm making this up. I know nothing about dinosaurs. But so part of the, the task for grownups is to give their children enough experiences, whether it's books or things or stories or walks, different ways to go to school or noticing things in the grocery store. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be a museum. Uh, but but giving them enough things so they can be surprised because the old, the same old things will no longer be surprising to them. And the only other thing I would say about all of this um, in, in response to what you said is that um, curious parents help encourage children to be curious. And it's hard to fake that. When I give workshops to teachers and I begin the workshop by saying, so start by telling me what you're really curious about. Many teachers, at least in the United States, are thrown by that question. They think I'm asking about their professional interests in education or curriculum or God knows assessment. I'm not. I'm asking them what thing in their life, you know, they can't get enough of, they need to know more about. And the reason I ask them that is because research from my own lab, among other places, shows that kids are influenced by the curious behavior and conversation of the grown-ups around them. So one way to encourage them to notice surprise, to pursue what intrigues them or violates their expectations, is to allow them to have experiences that will surprise them and that will offer them mysteries to be solved. And the other way is to be curious yourself. I really love that. And a spontaneous thought has just occurred to me that I want to run by you. In this age of perfectionism, in this age that, you know, we've, we've got work to do and children have to learn and we've got to grade them and we've got to get them through the curriculum. And in, in a world where parents are you know busy and they like their house to be clean and uh, the children are supposed to be scheduled and structured and all that kind of thing. And I know that in some ways I'm making a caricature because most people actually aren't quite that extreme, but you know that that right. general sense of this is what we're all about. We're about productivity and efficiency and maximizing and and so forth. I have a, a hypothesis that's sort of popped into my head as as you've been saying this. I'm curious about this, Susan. If um if I was a parent who wanted to give my child experiences where they want to know more because expectations are violated. What would happen if I consistently made intentional mistakes while I was doing things with my children? Would that promote curiosity? Uh, well, I, as you've probably already caught this from what I've said before, I, I'm kind of wary of parents being too deliberate about their parenting. In a different book I wrote, For Parents, I talked about this idea that parenting isn't a job, it's a relationship. Um, and I worry about parents trying to act like it's another thing they can get an A plus in. Uh, um, yeah, sure. So, no, uh, that, that's not quite what I was what I was meaning. Maybe I framed the okay. question incorrectly. I'm thinking if I'm in the middle of cooking and mm -hmm. I decide that I'm going to uh, cook a batch of, of cookies and instead yeah. of following the recipe, we're going to say, well, what happens if we add too much salt? Why don't, oh. why, why don't we taste the cookies with too much salt and let's learn, let's learn through making errors. Or maybe I'm just going to let my child do it with my supervision, but I'm not going to give them any direction. So if they, okay. if they get it wrong, we're going right. to highlight what they've done and see, you know, that this is not in alignment with expectation and therefore we may not get the same result. What can we learn from that? I'm kind of thinking 
as children become their own little naive scientists, they're going to make mistakes with appropriate parental oversight and intervention. We get to sort of make mistakes together. And as we make those mistakes, surely that's going to help us to learn more than sitting there and following the, the directions in the recipe book perfectly. Absolutely. And one piece of, so one thing you're talking about, which is wonderful, is speculating outside, out, out loud with your kids. I wonder what would happen if we use cinnamon instead of sugar, or I wonder what will happen if we put the dill in the fridge before we cook it, something I have uh, done. Cause what, I hap- have what happens when you put the dill in the fridge before you cook it? What, what, how it's is, better. Is- the cookies are better. The butter gets cold and the cookies ha- are more tender. Oh, the dough. I thought you said the dill. Uh, no dough. So, so when sorry. you so, so sorry. So when you put the dough in the fridge, it changes the way the cookies taste. Yeah. I it's never true. knew that. Really. Very good tip. This, this has been such um, a good conversation already. <laughs> it's useful, right? But <laughs> but speculating, being willing to try things out with your kids, um, is wonderful because you're modeling for them the kind of thinking you want them to engage in, um, and it's more fun. I mean, so one thing that this touches on. Uh, that's very important is that parents and teachers should let go of the idea that they need to know everything and they need to be right. Uh, yeah. Way better yeah. to be wrong and to not know things and, and sh- share with your child the experience of getting to know something you don't know, because that's what curiosity is all about. Uh, the pleasure of expecting to know something that you don't yet know. Susan, when and, my children were young, I used to say to them, uh, I'd, I'd give them an answer. I'd teach them something. I, I I knew everything. And when they'd say, dad, how do you know? I would say, well, I know everything because I thought dads were supposed to know everything. And I'd puff uh, my chest out and say, young. I know everything. But but I've learned over the years that that was yeah. one of the worst things that I could say because my, <laughs> my children not only thought that I became the oracle and the, you know, the font of all wisdom, but as they got older, I started to discover that I couldn't answer all of their questions and I didn't know everything. And their, their faith in me dropped because now I was no longer as impervious to curiosity. I, you know, I, like I, right. I, I didn't know everything and they didn't like that. I didn't know everything. Right. And I had to, I've had to really work very, very hard to, to in, to undoctrinate my children. I don't know if that's a word, yeah. but to, that's to, a great word. You should stick with oh, it. I will. Thank you. Uh, to, <laughs> to help them to realize, you know, dad doesn't know everything and neither does mom, but let's figure this out together. That's a great, a great approach. Um, and as I said, when you, by, by speculating out loud, by being wrong, by thinking, huh, I wonder why that didn't go the way I thought, or I realize that I have no idea what's going to happen when we do this. Let's try it together. I wonder what will happen. All of those are the best tools you can give your kid academically and intellectually, uh, which is to think, to speculate, to imagine different endings to something, to reflect on what went wrong and learn from it. Those are the best intellectual tools you could equip your child with. And they happen not by knowing everything, but by showing them the pleasure of not knowing things and coming to learn things. Susan, it's been so nice spending some time with you here on the Happy Families podcast. We're going to continue this discussion next week. If you want to check out some of the books that we've already mentioned, they are for you once again, The Hungry Mind, The Origins of Curiosity in Childhood and The Intellectual Lives of Children. Yeah, we'll put some links to those in the show notes. Hey, uh, just very quickly, a five-star review came through from Lil Louis XIX. I don't know if that's like Lil Louis 19 or something like that, a Roman numeral or something like that, but it was a five-star review and I just wanted to read it short but certainly sweet. That's what they said about the podcast and that's what I'm saying about the review because it's five stars and it just says, been a follower of Justin for some time uh, now, but so grateful for him and Kylie bringing these short, sweet and informative parenting podcasts. They're real relatable and these parenting nuggets are easy to digest. Love your voices too, guys. So soothing. How nice is that? (laughs) That's so nice. We really appreciate the five-star ratings and reviews that have been coming through thick and fast lately via Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Please keep them coming. They take about 60 seconds to to jot down and and, and to uh, put into your podcast machine. But what happens is when you do it, other people find out about the podcast and make their families happier. So Little Louie 19, thank you so much for your five-star review. If you do enjoy the podcast, uh, tell your friends or leave a rating and review. We're grateful for Justin Rulon from Bridge Media for producing the podcast and making it sound as good as it does. Also, Craig Bruce is our executive producer. And if you'd like more information about how you can make your family happy, please go to happyfamilies.com.au. Listener.